Um, I want to invite uh, Arthur Gervais to the stage from Liquidity Network. He is, <laughs> yeah, let's give him a hand. He's going to be talking about, um, he's actually going to be talking about a solution kind of to the problem that Martin had already outlined, uh, focusing on how you can prevent front running using zero knowledge, proofs and time lapse. Time lapse cryptography. Cool. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, that's like rather a broad intro because the prior two talks I think summarized the, the topics very well. Um, but financial exchanges are really at the heart of our economy, um, and speed matters. Um, and what we see in the in the traditional world is we have these very centralized operators here that. Um, have custody of their funds. So f over the last centuries, there was no alternative actually to to use uh, to, to trade significant volumes, but to do um, to, to go over these centralized custodians. Um, on a very high level, financial exchanges 101 is uh, an exchange is built out of two components. So we have a trade matching system and we have a trade settlement system. And this really is the exchange in a very simplified manner. So if you if you look at um, at the uh, at Martin's talk previously, he explained how to do this without a central entity, which is really amazing. Um, but here we're looking into, in this talk, we're gonna focus still on, a, on an operator model uh, where we have a, an, an order book. So this is an exchange um, architecture. Let's assume here we have two traders. So there's Michaela, she has some black coin. There's um, um, Jackson, he has some white coin, and they would like to trade these coins. Um, so Michaela puts in an order, I would like to sell um, this black coin and get a white coin, and the same done by Jackson. Well, and then the matching system can say, great, I have two matching orders, I can forward them now to the trade settlement layer. So the trade settlement here just switched the trades. You see the trade was executed on the, on the settlement layer. So what could possibly go wrong? Um, Martin thankfully already mentioned uh, very well front-running resilience uh, or front-running uh, issues. So there are actually m many different things that can go wrong in, uh, in exchanges and it's really fun. You can go to the uh, New York Stock Exchange website. They have a compilation of all the kinds of issues. So it seems traders in the, in the last decades have become very creative on, on different mal maleficences. Um, within this talk, we will focus on front-running primarily and it's defined as when you enter into an equity trade on option or futures contract with advanced knowledge of a block transaction, so like a large transaction, and you're aware that you're basically you're entering into this trade will influence the price of the underlying security, and your only intention here is to capitalize on the trade. So you, you're aware your order will, or your, your trade will change the price, and you're trying to capitalize on that change. Um, that's actually forbidden by the SEC, so according to ESU law. And uh, traders are not allowed to act on non-public information in general, so which, is, which spans across um, insider trading, to trade ahead of customers lacking that knowledge. So it should be public knowledge. Um, so now some might argue, well, if you do front-running in a blockchain, these transactions, they are broadcasted, everyone knows about, right? So it's like it's transparent. Um, so another malficience is wash trading. Um, this is where you can create beautiful gardens, um, and here you can you can see uh, we have analyzed some blockchain exchanges, on-chain exchanges, and you can see some addresses are trading with themselves, creating beautiful flowers. Um, so the talk will be mostly about front-running, just to give you some examples that there are many other different uh, security issues in exchanges, in particular if you're looking at uh, blockchain-based exchanges. The question we should ask ourselves is, so who is actually the adversary? Who is the malicious entity that we're dealing with? Um, there is a, a blockchain miner, there's an adversary trader, like your other traders. Some financial traders say, well, trading is like a war, right? You go into war and it's, or it's like a jungle, like Ray Dalio says, and, and you really have to fight. Um, so your opposing traders are kind of your opponents here. Um, or the operator, so if you're not, not having a um, a Dutch auction model like Martin presented, then you're probably dealing with some centralized operator here who might or might not front run your trades. Why is that a problem? Um, in reality nowadays, most crypto exchanges are not regulated. So the regulators haven't yet caught up 
with regulating what, what is good and what is bad behavior. Moreover, it's really hard to detect bad behavior and you can almost never prove it. Um, so it could be that you have an exchange that offers you zero trading fees, but maybe they just capitalize on your trades by front running them constantly. So there are potentially millions of US dollars in damages every year. Um, and one recent study by Diane et al. tried to quantify uh, for on-chain exchanges how much or how much front-running practices there are. So it's an excellent paper I recommend you have a look at. So let's look at the trade matching engine first. So trade matching engine is really just an order book um, where you collect bid and asks. And uh, Michaela here, for example, wants to buy a certain asset and um, Jackson wants to sell a certain asset at a certain price. So there's a certain spread here. Um, so because they haven't yet matched um, to, to agree on a trade. Um, in this talk, we will be um, looking at two order book models. So you can either put the order book on the server side or on, on chain on some exchange, uh, on, on the blockchain. So <coughs> the, the advantage of um, putting the order book on the server side is that you have a fast matching, right? Um, there's no fees for canceled orders. Um, there's, sensors, there's no censorship resistance, however. So the exchange can choose to not accept your orders. And there's exchange fund running. So here, the adversary is the exchange operator who can um, uh, designate a certain order to, to your incoming trades. If you go with the on-chain model, well, you do have great censorship resistance. It's fairly robust, right? I mean, your broadcasting is to the world. Everybody has your trades. However, you have slow matching. Uh, you, need to fee you need to pay blockchain fees for every order, um, even if they're not fulfilled. And now you're having a different set of adversaries. You're having the miners and the adversary traders. So miners can just reorder within a block or sensor, as was discussed earlier. Or the traders can um, pay a higher gas price or high transaction fees in general to prioritize their transactions and try to front run you. Um, we will discuss the, the, the tra trade settlement layer, but we will focus on non-custodial trade settlement layers. And there are two models that we, um, that we could think of. So there's an off-chain model um, and there's an on-chain model again. So by off-chain, I'm, I'm, re I'm referring here to the broad set of off-chain techniques that are out there whereby you can perform a transaction off the blockchain, but it's secured by the blockchain. Um, we published a paper um, recently of trying to summarize the state of the art in off-chain solutions. And I mean, the field is progressing so fast, so there might be a few that that uh, that, are that have basically come up since then. So, if the trade settlement is on chain, again we have censorship resistance. It's fairly robust, uh, but it doesn't scale and it's quite slow, which is bad. In financial in financial exchanges, as was discussed earlier, you want to you don't want to be the slow exchange because otherwise the fast exchanges are are profiting off you. Um, the block there are blockchain fees for each order and minor trade trader front running. If you do the um, settlement off-chain, it's fast and scalable. There are typically no blockchain fees, no minor trader front running, um, but you don't have censorship resistance um, and the exchange operator could front run. So as a summary, this is kind of the design space that we're looking at within this talk. There might be further options like, like the Dutch auctions that we saw earlier. Um, so for the purpose of our exchange, uh, TAX, the trustless exchange, um, we settled with this architecture. So a server that maintains an order book and an off-chain protocol, um, trade settlement protocol that I will go into details later. So what about the server exchange um, trade matching system? So here we can see, well, it's good because we, we're quite immune to front running from miners and traders. So those bad guys are gone, right? Um, however, now, well, the server can front run our orders. So. We will, go, we will talk about this now in the front-running resilient order book. So by resilient, I mean almost immune. It's probabilistically, um, it can probabilistically detect front-running. Um, and if, you, if you're willing to take certain assumptions, it's, it's actually robust. So the underlying idea that we had to, to build such a fr uh, front-running resilient order book is to have a commit and reveal protocol for limit orders. Um, our goals was that it's difficult to DOS the exchange. Um, we want to hide the order content before the exchange commits to an order so that the exchange actually doesn't know anything about the trade 
information like what what coin I'm buying or what asset I'm buying, what volume uh, or selling. Um, but the exchange still needs to know that an order is valid uh, before committing to, a, to an order. Sounds like a perfect use case for ZKPs. Um, the faster the exchange commits to a particular order, the better, because then we know that likely there was no front running. And this is where we came in with a moonwalk order. So in order to prevent front running, we're using moonwalk orders, which are composed of a zero knowledge proof, the encrypted order, and a time lock puzzle. So why do we need the zero knowledge proof? The zero knowledge proof proves that the order is a valid order and that I'm allowed to spend this amount of assets or buy this amount of assets. The encrypted order is basically just the, the, the order contents in an encrypted form that the exchange can decrypt with the time lock puzzle. So the time lock puzzle allows the exchange to decrypt an order after time t in case that the, that the trader doesn't reveal the, the appropriate key. So let's go into the protocol and see step by step how this would work. So we have here Michaela, the trader. Um, we have a trade matching off-chain settlement system on the server that by default would, be front would not resist front running from the operator. We have here a parent chain, a blockchain, and a smart contract. So Michaela tr creates this moonwalk order with the ZKP encrypted order and the time lock puzzle. She then sends this order to the exchange. Uh, so that's an encrypted order. The exchange doesn't see the contents of the order. Um, and uh, the exchange has a Merkle Mountain range of existing orders. So it will append um, this new order to the Merkle Mountain range and send the commitment of this MMR back to Michaela. So now what Michaela can do, she can measure the round trip time it took for the exchange to send this order back, right? And um, so the faster the exchange came back, the less likely the exchange was actually attempting to solve the time lock puzzle that would allow the exchange to look into the encrypted order. If Michaela is nice, she will reveal the key. Um, and once this happens, the exchange basically allows Michaela uh, to resubmit a new order. So that's one DOS protection mechanism here for the exchange, whereby the, the exchange only allows the trader to submit a new order if the trader revealed the prior key. So what's interesting here is Michaela can repeat this. She can actually test the exchange multiple times. And you can just do this for very small orders and always measure this delta T, the, the time that the exchange uh, uh, takes to respond. And if you know how much time it would take with the best computational hardware that you're aware to decrypt the time lock puzzle, if you're aware of the round trip time, the network latency to the exchange, you can roughly appro approximate whether, or you can guess, whether the exchange attempted to front run your order uh, or not. So front running here would require the exchange to change the Merkle Mountain range commitment, and this Merkle Mountain range commitment is checkpointed at regular intervals to the on-chain smart contract where Michaela can prove maleficence uh, later on. So it's really about, it's almost about building trust. So you have an operator, he can decrypt the order in T seconds, uh, if it takes Michaela T seconds to receive back the receipt of the Merkle Mountain range, then front running can happen. It doesn't have to, but it can. Um, so Michaela would basically issue K fake or small orders to, to build up trust here. Um, if the exchange would do anything malicious, then we can always go re resort to the on-chain smart contract and challenge the, the operator. And for example, there can be a slashing of a certain deposit or some other actions. Or Possible. So we, we don't specify this. What about the trade settlement layer? So now we looked at the order book, but um, once we have found two matching trades, we want to settle them. So which off-chain solutions do we want to look at? There are many solutions out there. Um, I think the, the, the broad categories would be channel networks and commit chains. Um, so commit chains, for example, they are fraud proof based, validity proof based. There are a lot of solutions out there. Um, we settled with NoCast because we, we developed NoCast. Um, and NoCast also has a zero knowledge version. So if you're looking also at, at real world systems in production, so there's, on the one side there's Lightning, but yeah, we, we couldn't really see how to do atomic trades uh, or to build the DEX on, on the Lightning network here. 
and there's the liquidity network who implements and, and runs the, the NoCast protocol in production since March this year. And you can see real, real traffic on, on, on this network. So roughly on a high level, I just want to give you a glimpse of what a commit chain is, and there are many variations of this, so that's quite cool, the, the design space is really large. You basically have a blockchain, uh, you have a central operator, the central operator commits an off-chain state in typically a constant size checkpoint or via snark, stark, etc. Um, and there are a certain set of off-chain off transactions or swaps uh, or tarmac swaps that, that happen off-chain. And basically here the, the operator would commit at regular intervals. These can be smaller or larger. It's really just a parameter like the block size or the block time interval in a, in a layer one blockchain. Um, depending on the design, um, you specify here round or eon size and it might, might, your users might be required to come online to verify the integrity of those checkpoints. It really depends on, on the specific design that you're looking at. Um, in Noka specifically, we, we have this, this is the key innovation, it's a, it's a Merkle interval tree where each account is represented as a balance, where we have an active and a passive tree, um, whereby a user can be offline to receive a payment or even a swap. So in the case of tax, um, two traders, so two traders that, that want to match a trade, they don't have to be online at the same time to match the trade. That's a very important requirement, right? You don't want users to be or require to, to traders to be online at the same time for their trades to match. Um, NOCAS ZKP is an extension to NOCAS which adds your knowledge proofs to, to this checkpoint. Um, what we're using is a recursively composed, uh, recursively composed proofs. Um, so the idea here is that we could potentially enable a distributed ZK miner. So instead of having one central operator who does this big giant proof, which is computationally very expensive, we could outsource this to a set of miners. And this, this, was add, this would actually add to decentralization uh, because then the central operator would depend on the collaboration of those individual miners. Um, yeah, Xenon knowledge proofs reduce a few attack vectors that would be otherwise uh, possible. Um, we currently evaluated the gas costs is about 500k uh, pre-EIP 1108 and by a factor of five smaller um, uh, post-EIP. So because we are fraud proof based, the commit chain can be halted. So what could happen if, uh, if, if the exchange does something malicious or is being dosed for a continuous amount of time? So in any case, if, if it doesn't render its service properly, um, a NOCUS commit chain can be halted, so this means some trades would be reverted. Um, in, in the trading world, this is a bit less tricky than in the payment world, where because in the trading world, you would get back basically your prior assets. Um, in, the, in the payment system, this is this should be mostly insured. Um, but this can, be, this can be fixed by providing collateral for, for instant finality. Still, the, the proofs are quite computationally expensive uh, to, to be performed. Um, so on the right side, you can see the, the wallet um, of Liquidity Network that, that already is on the Play Store and App Store on Mainnet. And on the left side, you can see a, a mock-up of Tex, but you can already try the RingB version. It's online, uh, tex.liquidity.network. Basically, you can send funds from the mobile wallet to the exchange uh, near instantly and then trade on, on the RingB network on the, on the exchange. So we really see this as, as being a layer where you can, you can build up your, your DEX or your, your, your particular wallet and um, yeah, enable it to, to be more scalable. Um, the full details are uh, published in those two papers. So if you have any questions, we try to be as precise as possible. Um, and we know there are so many subtleties, it's really hard to, to, to explain them very well. But I think it's very important to, to have this open research and, and details such that anyone can, can build such systems or extend them and build, bet build better ones. So thank you very much, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, just make your way over to the race uh, it's working thank you very much Arthur um, one question regarding the moonwalk orders so when the user wants to prove that he has the right amount of balance and he can actually execute the trade um, he, he proves it according to what state 
I mean, how does he prove that he has the enough balance? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so the the front rowing resilient order book and the trade settlement layer are not that decoupled as I presented them in the in the slides. Um, so in our case, we actually mix the information of the trade settlement layer with information of the of the exchange order book. Um, so. I mean, the, the ideally, it would be great if some, even some centralized custodial exchanges could use the front-running resilient order book design, but then they wouldn't be able to include, a pro probably, I mean, probably would be trickier to include a proof that a trader has a certain balance to be executed. Um, in our case, we mix the information of the trade settlement layer um, and therefore have access to this data. Thanks. Um, thank you. I was wondering if uh, when a trader realizes that they might be being front run because of the responses being too slow, is that limited to just subjective knowledge or is there some way that they could prove this or have you thought about that kind of a thing? Right. Um, so here we are really trying to detect, in, a, in the first instance, to detect front running. Um, the so the the exchange the, the, the trader receives a receipt or so the the, the head of the Mercury Martin range uh, from the exchange and that's a commitment that's a non repudiable signature that the trader gets if the exchange would then commit on chain um, a non um, compatible checkpoint then there's actually cryptographic proof that there was front running yeah, sorry. My question was about the because I, my understanding is that the the front running is coming from uh, the uh, the front running detection is coming from the delay, right? Um, right, right? So let's say I'm always getting slow responses. Uh, that just means that I'm going to avoid avoid trading there. Uh, but I can I have you thought about how to prove it to other people that, that they should also avoid trading there? Um, I mean, if you have a if you have a signature from the exchange okay. on on a certain Merkle Martin range and the exchange does not commit to the same one later on, then you do have a proof that you can show to others that the exchange actually performed front running. Oh, okay. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. One Hi. I think there's, a, there's another question over here. Oh, sorry. Um, just, just one question. Why, why is it uh, important to prove that the order is valid? I mean, what would be the issue if someone just submits uh, an order and then it's kind of encrypted and it turns out that they don't have enough balance but it's just ignored? Right. Um, I mean, it, so this this exchange is not directly, I believe at least, uh, I mean, the further me me measurements and, and studies uh, should, should show this. I don't believe it's suitable for high frequency trading because if a trader does not reveal a key, um, then the exchange is forced to open up the, ti the time lock, right? So this might take at most time t. The good thing is if many traders are kind of trying to dust the exchange at the same time, then the exchange can parallelize the decryption of these time lock orders. Um, um, so your question was why would we why would we prove or why would we try uh, yeah, to? Yeah, I mean basically why it's uh, I mean why it's necessary to prove that this order is is valid. I mean would it hurt to? It would. It basically reduces the 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 number of attack vectors for the exchange. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the main reason, right? So there might be other other ways to to reduce those uh, vectors. Yeah, but uh, zero knowledge proof verification is very quick, so it doesn't hurt. I mean, it's more work on the client side to prove that this is actually a valid order. Yeah. Hi. Do you see any other uh, things that are required from the regulator? Uh, such as front running, uh, as market conduct, for example, spoofing, watch trading, publishing of LIBOR, all of this exists already in, in the trading, right? Yeah. And currently, by the way, the, um, from the regulator, the responsibility is from the action, not from the exchange to, to um, mitigate that, but from the one that is, for example, big banks to take action upon that. Do you see any action that is currently being taken by the regulator, or it's still in? I have not seen any action so far. Um, I, I really see um, th this kind of solution, I, I see it as a competitive advantage for exchanges today um, for just being honest uh, before the regulators even come in. But I haven't seen any, any actions. And I can only speak for Switzerland, for Swiss regulations, for example, if you're non-custodial, 
exchange, then you're not even um, subject to AML KYC laws. Okay, thanks. Thanks. All right, there's, there's actually a little bit more time if anyone has any more questions. No? All right, so then I guess we'll move it up. It's a, we're gonna start catching up on time. Thank you.